the assets. Okay. Let's say I'm nominated as a trustee. Do I have to accept? And what should I think about before accepting? Mike, and, um, when you're nominated, typically what that means is I've created a trust and I've said that if I become incapacitated or in the event of my death, I want you, Mike, to be my trustee, I'm putting you in a position where I'm giving you a lot of responsibility. And at the time, you may have said, that would be fine, Bob, I'd be happy to be your trustee, but you know, I plan on living a long time and you may not be in the best health at the time of my death or you may be deceased yourself. Do you have to serve as trustee? And the answer quite simply is no. No one has to serve as trustee. The real key is don't accept the role and then back out of the role because the minute you accept the role, you have all sorts of liabilities that are affiliated or associated with that acceptance. If you decide that one, I don't have the time, I don't have the desire, I don't want the exposure or liability, just decline, sign a, a declination to serve as trustee and the law will never impose any liability on you for not serving. They will impose liability on you where you start to serve and then decide you want to back out uh, without backing out properly. So be cautious, if you're designated as a trustee down the road, I always suggest seek some good legal advice. What does that mean? What rules do I have to follow? What liabilities am I taking on in this mm -hmm. role? Uh, and how do I minimize those liabilities? Right. And I think uh, an important part of this assessment is how do the people in the family seem to be getting along? So again, you, you may not want to step into the role of referee, maybe you know, they, they need a professional to get involved in that sort of a situation. Yeah, it's unfortunately as part of our society in today's world, we oftentimes will say this is free money on the table. And uh, because of the economy in part, because of human nature in part, um, di dividing up that pie is not always a simple task, no matter what the settlor said. Mm -hmm. So that greed factor, unfortunately, creates a lot of headache for trustees. Mm -hmm. And the more dysfunctional the family, the more cautious a prospective trustee ought to be. Right. Okay. Um, are there notice requirements for trusts? There are. Um, California law, about 10, 15 years ago, passed a law that said when a set law of a trust dies and a trust becomes irrevocable, uh, the successor trustee must give a statutory notice to all heirs and beneficiaries. And that notice says essentially that I'm now the trustee, that venue is proper in this county, Santa Clara County as an example. Uh, but most importantly, it says to the heirs and beneficiaries, you have 120 days from the day you receive this to challenge the validity of the trust. You mm -hmm. can ask for a copy of the trust or we can send it to you you have 120 days and that almost four month time period starts a statute of limitations running that says if you challenge it on day 121 you're going to be barred. Mm -hmm. uh, so that initial notice has to go out generally within 60 days of death. Okay. What about creditors? <coughs> Typically you're bound by the trust instrument. Almost all trust instruments are going to say um, that the trustee has discretion to pay all the legitimate debts of the trust. Um, if so, you have a duty to determine who are the legitimate creditors, what debts are there that may have been owing at the moment of death, and have those debts paid. Um, there is, unlike a probate estate, there is no notice that goes out automatically to creditors. A trustee does not have to send a notice out. If they don't send any notices out to known or reasonably ascertainable creditors, um, creditors have about a year to file a, a claim. Otherwise, they could be barred in most circumstances. A trustee does have the option to try and shorten that period of time to four months mm -hmm. uh, by giving a statutory notice 
going into court, getting a, a court order, and then giving notice to the known or reasonably ascertainable creditors. Mm -hmm. That is used more by bank trustees, less by individuals, uh, because now you're alerting creditors to the fact that you've got to file a claim. Uh, many trustees will just rely on the one-year statute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, are there other notices that you need to think about aside from related to the trust administration? I'm, I guess I'm thinking of sort of support to the family. Uh, well, there are status reports that we give to the family periodically. Here's the trust. Here are the trust terms. Here's the process that we're going to follow but it's not required. There is no status report that's required. The only other notice is you still have to give notice to Department of Health Services if there was, uh, if the deceased settlor was receiving any sort of Medicaid, federal benefits. Um, Social Security is, I guess they're actually usually notified by the, uh, uh, mortuary. the mortuary. Yeah, the mortuary in almost in all cases notifies Social Security because they process the death certificate. So mm -hmm. Social Security will back out the last payment uh, automatically from any auto deposit. It'll be auto credited back to Social Security. <laughs> the only uh, other notices are sometimes we'll file a, a Form 56 Notice of Fiduciary Relationship with the Internal Revenue Service, um, things of that nature. Yeah, and then sometimes we have assets that may be from something like joint tenancy or then maybe there's a retirement account or... Well, those would be non-trust assets. Right. Uh, and on non-trust assets, we'll determine who's entitled to that asset. If it's not the trust, um, we'll generally notify or have the executor or trustee notify that beneficiary to go process this mm -hmm. um, paperwork on your own. You're the beneficiary. You complete the claim form. Okay. We can't do it for you. Okay. Does having a trust mean it takes less time to administer property after a death? And if it does, why? In most cases, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. um, I can generally get through a trust administration in two or three meetings with a client over the course of two or three months. And I say this generally. There are always rules and exceptions. But if the trust is not complex, if the assets are not complex, if it's pretty straightforward and I have a, a trustee who follows my instructions, we can be done in a short amount of time. That translates to being less costly. The mm -hmm. shorter amount of time I have to spend with the client and the more uh, responsive they are to our action items, the quicker this administration will take place, the less costly it'll be. Okay. Now, are additional trusts typically created from a single living trust? And what purposes can they serve, and how long will they usually last? And the answer is it depends upon the family, mm -hmm. and it depends upon the size of the estate. In a husband and wife context, we will oftentimes, in larger estates, create what's called an AB or an ABC trust, meaning at the first death, we'll break this one trust down into sub-trusts. And this is done primarily for tax purposes. In a single person situation where there might be minor children and following the death of that person, um, we have two or three minor children, we'll oftentimes funnel that down into separate subtrusts, one for each child. That will continue on for a period of time until the child reaches the maturity level um, as set forth in the trust instrument. So it's not uncommon, indeed it's more often than not, that we will have ongoing trust administrations um, for a period of time, sometimes for the lifetime of a beneficiary. Mm -hmm. um, and so getting that trust administration set up properly, funded properly, and then monitored periodically is important to protect the trustee. Okay. So uh, for my personal accounting, a lot of times I'll just write the deposit, I'll just write the total deposit down. Uh, some people don't even keep a personal checkbook and these days, they're not even getting their bank statements, you know, it's all on the internet. Uh, is that the way you should operate with a trust? Well, again, I go back to what does the trust instrument say? And in most cases, accountings are not going to be waived, they're going to be required. If they are required by the trust instrument, the trustee has a duty to keep track of every penny that comes into the trust during his or her tenure as trustee, as well as every expenditure. So 
having bank statements online is not inappropriate. It's not wrong yeah. per se. It just means that you better be able to print those out mm -hmm. um, so we can defend them if and when a challenge comes to your accounting. So the simple answer is no. You can't administer this trust and account for it informally like you might do with your own assets. When you're managing my money, mm -hmm. I want to see every dime that came in and every dime that went out, and I want you to account for it. And the same thing goes for a trust because you are managing someone else's assets and right. resources. Right. So you really need to keep detailed stuff. So this means real conscientious record keeping, keeping you know, you pay the, you know, maybe the monthly uh, bill uh, for uh, the utility bill for the rental property or whatever. You need to keep these things uh, in files and so forth and have access to them in case somebody has questions. Organizational efficiency makes for a good trustee. <laughs> if you are a disorganized person, you may not want to be a trustee. There we go. Okay. Um, uh, we're really just about out of time, so I think what I'm going to do is let you throw out maybe some final thoughts related to this area of being a trustee. You know, a trustee is a job imbued with responsibility. You owe duties to the beneficiaries of the trust, uh, and they're expecting a lot out of you. Uh, unfortunately, what we see in our practice is a fair amount of litigation, either trustees that didn't discharge their obligations uh, appropriately and are being sued by beneficiaries uh, or alternatively they did so somewhat carelessly and as a result um, they are a target you know before you serve as trustee know what you're getting into make sure you get some good legal advice uh, and then if you always think of it in terms of I am managing somebody else's property. I cannot take the same risk that I might be willing to take with my own assets. I cannot do that with somebody else's assets. I have to manage them prudently, efficiently, and follow the terms of the trust. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, you'll stay out of trouble. Okay. And the beneficiaries will appreciate your efforts. I hope so. Bob, thanks so much for being my, my guest pleasure. and sharing this very important information. Uh, folks, uh, we weren't able to cover all of the questions, you know, just to let you know. Again, we, this was just introductory material, but we hope that we've given you some things to think about and uh, that you found this to be valuable. Uh, we're going to be posting this at the website, financialinsiderweekly.com, so tell your friends. And uh, we hope you can join us next time on Financial Insider Weekly.